Hallelujah. Good evening, everyone. You're welcome to the service today. This is the King Scott Bible teaching, prayer, and leadership development service. We're going to start off from where we left off at in our series, Prayers from the Book of Acts, but let's start off with prayers. <clears throat> Father, we give you praise. Thank you, Lord, for yet another time in your presence. Thank you for the privilege and the access given, Lord, to come boldly, to come to your presence by the new and living way that the Lord Jesus has consecrated through his broken body, his shed blood. We are grateful. His name becomes our visa, our passport to come before your presence. And we thank you for that. Thank you also for the Holy Spirit whom you've sent to us, Lord Jesus, who continually teaches us, enlightens us, brings to us kingdom truths, keys of the kingdom. And we continue to embrace, receive, and humble ourselves in obedience to your word as we continue to acknowledge the work of the Holy Spirit. I bless my brothers and sisters, everyone under the sound of my voice and everyone who will watch or listen to this in time to come. Thank you, Lord, for your word brings blessing. The Bible says the entrance of the word brings light brings deliverance and so we receive that light that comes through your word in jesus name amen amen again you're welcome this is the king's god bible teaching prayer and leadership development service we've been on a series studying prayers from the book of acts and we're going to continue but before we do that i want to quickly remind us of our upcoming prophetic watch service Again, we don't call it crossover anymore. There's, you're really not crossing into anything. It's just one calendar day to another, another calendar year unfolding. But prophetically, God could be saying things. So we call it a prophetic watch. We, we want to posture ourselves. We are already posturing ourselves uh, to hear what the Lord would say to us, both for our lives as individuals and then perhaps our cities, our regions, our nations, and perhaps the Gregorian calendar year itself. And it will be a joy to declare as much as the Lord reveals. So it's going to happen this two days from now, Friday, uh, December 31st, 2021. Uh, the King's Scott is going to be in person. We're going to have it recorded, but we may not have it as Facebook Live. We'll, we'll find out. We'll tell when we get there. And the reason for that, I know some might be asking why. The reason for that is we feel like, you know, we want the Holy Spirit to have liberty to speak to us the way he wants to. If it's going to be a rebuke, <laughs> then we don't want to broadcast that to you, you see. <clears throat> if it's going to correct us. If it's a correction of some sort, well, that's our personal thing. You don't have to hear all of that. But of course, we're going to... Um, you know, collate eventually and release what we feel is relevant to the larger body of Christ. So that is the reason behind it. All right. So well, let's go into our message today. Uh, prayers from the book of Acts. And this is part four, part four, prayers from the book of Acts, part four. So in this series, we said we're looking at spirit inspired prayers recorded in the book of Acts. <clears throat> And we know from our study so far that the Holy Spirit took charge of divine operations. He is the one who is in charge of divine operations. He is the administrator of the kingdom of God. When, when on the day of his arrival, in Acts, as shown in, in Acts chapter 2, he literally took over. The Holy Spirit took over. So a lot of times we, we give um, uh, you know, so much credit to human so agents. Even those called into, uh, say, the apostolic ministry. But in reality, the Holy Spirit is the one who is in charge. The Holy Spirit is the one who took over uh, the, the, the operations of God. The Holy Spirit took over literally. So we're going to find out, we found out actually in our studies that he also inspired, that is the Holy Spirit inspired a number of prayers and they were recorded for us in the book of Acts. So it will seem to us then that it's important to go back and see those prayers that were inspired by the Holy Spirit that were recorded for us because they become a template, they become templates for us. And we also know Paul will later tell us that the Holy Spirit does pray through us. 
So just for those who might have a, a, a question or an issue with a statement I made earlier about the Holy Spirit inspiring prayers, well, I mean, it's, it's, all, it's later in scriptures, but Paul also specifically tells us, you know, the Holy Spirit does pray through us. Uh, and, and the thing about the prayers that, we're, that are inspired by the Holy Spirit is that they always hit the targets. They are always done in accordance with the will of God. So if you want to pray prayers that are in alliance or in accordance with the will of God 100% of the time, then allow the Holy Spirit to inspire the prayers. Uh, that is not to say God doesn't care about our human needs or the things that happen to us. They, he does. And he actually invites us to make our requests known to him. Okay. But the truth of the matter is, as a matter of fact, the same scripture I just quoted, the next line says, and the God of peace will guard your hearts with all, you know, <laughs> will guard your hearts and mind in, through Christ Jesus. So he said, make your, make your, we pray, we pray on supplication and thanksgiving, make your request known to God. So when you make our request known to him, the next thing he wants to give us is peace. How he handles business is his sovereignty. But oftentimes when we pray, we want to see things happen in a certain way, in ways that we feel is the right way or, you know, some kind of expectation that we have. And oftentimes we are disappointed. And, and that is why a lot of people will ask the question, does God actually answer prayers? Because if prayers are not answered the way they expect it, if God doesn't move the way they expect it, but you got to think about each other, God, who is Lord here? Who is boss? Is it you or is it God? Is it you or is it the Holy Spirit? Is it you or is it the Lord Jesus? When you pray prayers, who, who answers them? Who responds to those prayers? So if you do not have the power to, to make your prayers happen, or in fact, the fact that you're praying in the first place is, is, a, is proof that we are inadequate in ourselves, why don't we just humble ourselves then and say, Lord, may your will be done. Or you do what is right. We already know God is love. We already know God cares about us. We already know God is good, and we already know that he, his thoughts towards us are shalom. They are thoughts of peace to bring us to an expected end, to give us a future and a hope. So why do we have reluctance? Why do we have this problem relying on God doing things in his own way, according to his own wisdom? Well, uh, uh, Paul tells us that the Holy Spirit does pray through us. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27 it said, likewise, the spirit also helps in our weaknesses. So there is this weakness that we all have. The earlier verses, it, it, it talks about no man knows what is the, the mind of, you know, in the mind of another person, except the spirit within that man, within that person. In the same way, no one knows the, what is in the mind of God, except the spirit of God. So likewise, the spirit also helps us. So it not only is God you know, way, 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 way above our pay grade, <laughs> our pay range when it comes to our perception, thought processes, expectations, you know, possible outcomes and all of that stuff. Because sometimes when you're expecting one outcome, you're not considering all the things. But the Lord God is omnipotent, he's sovereign, he's able to consider all factors, he puts all factors into consideration. He's the one who is the alpha, the omega, and everything in between also. So, so he is in a better position to give the perfect answers. Now, sometimes the perfect answers may not align with what we want. So Paul says that's a weakness that we all have. We all share that weakness. But thank God he didn't just leave us or abandon us to that weakness. The Bible says here, Paul, according to the scriptures, that the Holy Spirit actually comes to help. He's a helper indeed. Now, why wouldn't you want the help of the Holy Spirit? If he's here to help, why wouldn't you want the help of the Holy Spirit? Considering that you already have a weakness. We already have a weakness. He comes to help. And look at that weakness. We do not know. This is the divine uh, conclusion. It's, human beings do not know what we, they should pray for as they ought to. That is divine conclusion. We as humans do not know what we should pray for as we ought. We always think it is this. We always, we always think, oh, it's got to be this. So God, come to our aid. Stay on our side. 
fight our enemies, do it like this. We always think we know, but in reality, the divine conclusion is we don't. Humans don't know what they should pray for as they ought. And that is a weakness all humans share, no matter how anointed you are. But the spirit himself makes intercession for us. Now, when it says for us, it doesn't mean you keep quiet so that he just prays and then you go to sleep. No, of course, don't forget the Holy Spirit is in you, is in us. Uh, according to the Acts chapter 2, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began. So it's the same pattern, it's the same template, it's the same process. We've been filled with the Spirit and so we also begin. Or oh, he inspires us to order prayers that he inspires. So it's the same process. And he does this, look at that, with groanings which cannot be altered. Now what that means is left to our human devices, we cannot even touch this, this dimension of prayer. Left to our human abilities, we cannot even alter them. We cannot even get, get to them, you know, but, but they are inspired by the Spirit. Verse 27, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. God is the one who searches the hearts. Do you know sometimes even your, your vocal ability is not able to decode or, you know, encapsulate what is going on in your heart. As a matter of fact, that's why I use the word groanings, because there are sometimes you just get to a point, you can do, oh, whoo, oh, like, there are no words for it. You, you even lack words to express yourself. But the Holy Spirit, even at such times, is able to, you know, take that which is in the heart. Of course, this is a sanctified heart. This is a heart that is yielded to God, because of course, if the Holy Spirit is praying through you, it, that means you've yielded, you've submitted yourself to his, uh, you know, his operations. <clears throat> he knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because he makes the Spirit, makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Do you want to pray according to the will of God? Pray through the Holy Spirit. And by the way, let me quickly say something else. When we say pray through the Holy Spirit, it doesn't automatically mean praying tongues. You can actually say, brothers, I want us to pray in tongues, and that would be perfect. But when you say pray in the spirit, it is much more than just praying in tongues. You can actually pray in tongues and still be in your flesh. I've seen people walking around looking over, sha da 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 ya da 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 and they're not even engaged at all. That's not praying in the spirit. That's still in the flesh, even though in tongues. What does it mean to pray in the Spirit? To pray in the Spirit means to yield yourself to the Holy Spirit. It means to allow the Holy Spirit to embody you, I mean, to feel you and to inspire you and to receive utterance through the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, you could start with tongues or you could even start with words. And who knows, you could even go into languages that you've never spoken before. Whatever the Holy Spirit desires or whatever he inspires, it can also be groanings. But you see, it won't be just cliche or, or you know, make believe it will be for real, the Holy Spirit inspiring whatever is coming out of our vocal cords. All right, so it, is, it makes perfect sense then to go back uh, through the prayers recorded in the book of Acts, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Paul already told us the Holy Spirit prays through us. And we've seen in the book of Acts, they were, they were literally uh, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit and inspired to do things, including prayers. So as we go back to them, we will learn, and we have been learning quite a lot from them, and we've seen three already. But before we go into the fourth one today, let's talk about understanding the divine purpose of prayer. I think one of the problems or one of the issues we have or challenges we have as a body of believers is not understanding the divine purpose of prayer. Uh, we've, we've come to see prayer as something that is for us or something that we invented. It's like it is our thing. And so we can do it our way, you know, uh, uh, but that is not altogether correct. Modern day faith walk, modern day faith walk, you know, whether it's ministry, individual faith walk, whatever, which is largely driven by superhero mentality. What do you mean by superhero mentality? There is always this, it's a two-sided thing. Superhero mentality on the side of ministers is such that they, they, they arrogate to themselves an undue placement, like they have become the messiahs, like 
they they are the lead they want to play god in people's lives like i am anointed you know i'm anointed for this if i lay my hands on you i'll blow into the microphone i'll sprinkle oil on you i'll give you mantle prayer handkerchief holy water roll on the floor insecticide all the stuff we do that is super heroism or heroism is a mentality is acting like you're the superhero you're like you're the deliverer in your absence the people will die in your absence they will go to hell in your absence satan will just eat them for breakfast so you've got to come deliver you've got to come save them and so you must make it happen you must make things happen and this has led a lot of ministers away from the original call because they are trying to please the people or they are trying to prove a point that you don't have to. Jesus has proven all the points that needs to be proven. You don't have to prove no point. Stay in obedience to the call of God and let his power flow through you. But you are no Messiah. There is one Messiah and you are not that, that Messiah. His name is Yeshua, the Lord Jesus Christ. And our duty as ministers is to point people to him. Always. That is the goal. So when you now take the place of Christ in the lives of people, you actually play the superhero mentality. You're, you're playing into the superhero mentality. On the side of the, the, the church folks, it is, that, it is such that they cast everything on somebody. Somebody else has to do it. Oh, pastor, pray for me. Oh, man of God, blow into the microphone. Lay your hands on me. I pray over this oil. Oh, touch me. If you just touch me, it will be okay. If I, I mean, we, we, we've made ministers turn them to idols because of that superhero mentality. Whereas Jesus would say, come to me, all you who are laboring and are heavy laden, come to me. I'll give you rest. He didn't say, go look for a superhero. Or he didn't say, you become a superhero for my people. No, everyone, ministers and, and saints, come to me, he says. <coughs> Excuse me. He is the Messiah. He is the deliverer. And he's the only worthy sacrifice that God accepted. So no one should take that place. So the modern Christianity, modern faith walk, modern ministry, modern spiritual faith walk, whatever you call it, is largely driven by this superhero mentality. And so it has given a lean definition to prayer. And what is that lean definition? It's such that prayer is seen almost exclusively as a means to an end. Like, oh, I have to pray to get this. I have to pray to make this happen. It's like, almost like a means to an end. And mostly a selfish end. Because self is enthroned. Self is at the end of the goal, at uh, the end of the, you know, the end game. Self is in focus. Self is exalted. It's about what self gets. And so people are willing to even listen to this. People who are willing to punish self so as to enthrone self. I mean, think about it. What do I mean by that? People are willing to go 40 days fast, 21 days fast, seven days fast, punishing self. But when you look at what they are praying, it's still about gratifying self. It's still about self. Now, I'm not saying everybody, mostly. That's why I use the word mostly. It's mostly selfish. And people can take, I mean, can do a lot of things, but at the end of the day, it's all self. But prayer is much more than just a means to an end. It's much more than, you know, gratifying self. Think about this. When we consider that the Lord Jesus prayed often, and not only did he pray often, but for him, it was a vital necessity to his earthly ministry. When you consider that, it will make us understand that you know, prayer is beyond self because none of the prayers of Jesus was self-driven. None of his prayers. The ultimate one, of course, was the one he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but your will be done. And what was the will of God? You're going to go and die on the cross. Who wants to do that? So the prayers of Jesus, and don't forget, he came as the son of God. You know, virgin birth, all of that, but yet prayed. It tells you that prayer is beyond humans. Prayer is not just a human thing because it is, one could have said, oh, but you came from heaven. You are the son of God. You have the Holy Spirit. The Bible says he, he was given the Holy Spirit without measure. So why are you praying? See, that question comes from a mentality that looks at prayers as only a means to an end. So Jesus in praying shows us that prayer is not just a human thing. Prayer is not just a means to an end. Prayer is not just about self. 
It goes beyond self. Also, when you consider that prayers are offered in the eternal realms, <clears throat> as we are shown in the book of Revelations, don't forget, when you read the book of Revelations, you see, you know, the saints who have gone before us, angels, the 24 elders, the four living creatures, and all of that stuff, they pray too. So he just tells you prayer is beyond the human realm. Prayer is, number one, humans didn't originate it, because don't forget, earth was made at a certain point in time, but heavens, the heavens had been, you know, and even though earth was made at a certain time, man was made last. So humans, you are last on the list. You didn't invent this thing. Prayer had been in the eternal realms. The eternal beings do pray. And just because that is the case, you now know prayer is not limited to planet Earth or to life on Earth. So why do we make prayer only about planet Earth? What I want, what I need, what God must do for me, where I want to go, this and that, all about Earth. Earth everything's about Earth, Earth, Earth. When do we begin to pray prayers that are beyond planet Earth? Knowing that prayer traverses or prayer transcends, rather, transcends planet Earth, transcends self, transcends human, transcends needs, transcends the Earth. The divine beings pray too. They are not subject to the needs that we are subject to. They're not praying for dollars and pounds. They're not praying for all the stuff we pray for, but they pray all the same. So prayer goes beyond this realm. Prayer goes beyond the earth realm. <clears throat> so prayer is first an instrument. And when I say an instrument, think of, think of uh, something like a GPS or a scanner, something like that. Prayer is first an instrument to enable us determine the mind of God on a subject matter. So it's like a discerner. You know, remember the Hebrews talks about that, you know, there's, the word of God is a discerner of the intent and, 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 and the, the thoughts of man, of man's heart. Uh, the, the Bible again tells us the eyes of the Lord runs to and fro the earth, searching for those whose hearts are upright towards him so he can show himself strong on their behalf. You know, so the spirit of the Lord runs to and fro the earth also doing that. So, so prayer becomes first and foremost an instrument to determine the mind of God. So, so you, you're not, you, you probably don't even need to, you, you could pray in words, but you don't have to. If you're one who's already given to the spirit, who's already immersed in the spirit, all you probably just do is just, just meditating in your spirit. You are praying because you've assumed a spiritual posture of discerning, a spiritual posture of scanning, a spiritual posture of searching searching the mind of Christ, searching through scriptures, searching what the mind of the spirit might be, searching in some cases through the pages of the prophetic utterances that you've already, I mean, it depends on what the situation is. You're just searching. Okay, Lord, you know, what are you saying about this? Holy Spirit, give me understanding. Give me clarity. Let your light shine. You're not asking for anything. You're just trying to discover what is the will of God concerning the subject matter. <clears throat> And I dare say that is the first place to start from. Because if the scripture has already concluded that we don't know, then why do you want to step out on the wrong foot to start with? It says you don't know. If we don't know, then we should come to and through the Holy Spirit. Now, when the mind of God or the will of God or the counsel of God, again, depends on the situation or the instruction of God or the teaching of God or the command of God. I mean, they all go together. It just depends on what, what is in question. When that has been known or has been revealed, then prayer changes dimension. It then becomes a tool, no longer just a scanning instrument now because he's done that job. It now becomes a tool. And this tool is first and foremost inward. It becomes a tool that helps us humble self. May I tell you something, child of God? Self has no place in the plan of God. Self has no place. See, whenever self interjects, you know, it's pushed to the side. It's like, that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ told Satan. He said, you do not save all the things of God, but the things of man. Get behind me. That's self, because Peter's self arose, and but self, Satan can ride on self. Demons can ride on self. So what does God do to self? Get behind me. So you don't project self before God as a, you know, in your prayers. You want to put self on there. So the first thing to do is humble self. And oftentimes you're going to find self come against the will of God. Oftentimes, uh, please don't even question that because Jesus Christ showed us that this is the case. 
here in the Garden of Gethsemane, you could see represented our humanity perfectly as there seemed to be a struggle, a seeming struggle with what you already know is the will of God. But thank God he overcame, which is also a lesson to us that we must overcome, come to that place where we declare not our will, but the will of God be done. So we humble self through prayer. Prayer now becomes a, a, an instrument or a, a, rather a, 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 a tool to help us humble self and then align our will to the will of God. Align our posture to the will of God. It's going to be a shift. For some people, it might be a 180 shift. For some people, it might be a 90 degree shift. For some people, it might just be 45. For some people, it might just be five degrees, however the case. But there's that alignment happening, beginning to embrace the will of God. You're going to struggle. Come on. There's so many examples. Abraham. When the Lord told him, your only son, the son whom you loved, I'm sure there was a struggle, struggled for a moment before he eventually submitted. The Lord Jesus had just showed us, showed us the same. So you begin to walk on self using the prayer. Oh, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. I submit. You see, you're not still asking for anything yet. You've not even started asking. I submit my will to your will. You're going to have a, you're going to find your flesh like the temptation of Jesus Christ. Command the stones to become bread. Use the anointing. Use your connections. Pick your phone and call somebody, you know, oh Lord, no, I'm going to trust in you. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to trust in the arm of the flesh because those who trust in the arm of the flesh will fail. You're learning to trust God. Because if you, if as a child of God, any issue that comes up, you quickly run to your, your, your arsenal. You know, you have tools within your arsenal. You know whom to call. You know somebody in the government house. You know somebody who is an infinity merchant. You know what buttons to press. Then you're not living the faith life at all. You've not started living the faith life. God may ask you to use those tools that he's given you already, and that's wonderful, but he's got to be the priority. That's the point. He's got to be the priority. You start with him. Let him say, okay, call this person, call that person, or do this or do that. And it could be something you already had, but now is a thought says the Lord is not motivated by your flesh. That is the difference. So our will becomes aligned with the will of God regarding that matter. When that becomes the case, when our will has aligned with the will of God, then prayer now becomes a force. <laughs> And now becomes a force by which we declare and establish that revealed will of God on the earth, which aligns with Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, we, we quote that and we pray it, but the truth of the matter is, if you do not know the will of God that you established on the earth, how do you know when it's accomplished? How do you know when it's done? So it's got to be, first and foremost, a discerning to know what the will of God is concerning the matter. Secondly, aligning ourselves with it. And then thirdly, declaring that that will of God is what establishes on the earth. Now, it may not be over the entire earth. It may begin with your own circle of influence. It may be in your own life. Lord, this is your will. And I declare that is, that is the established reality I'm living by. I reject the, the opinions of men. I reject the soothsayers and the naysayers. I reject the false prophets of our day. But Lord, I stand upon the word of God, the revealed will of God, and I declare, as for me and my house, this is what it's going to be. You begin to declare that. Your kingdom come, your will be done in my life, in my home, in my family, in my health, in my finances, in my relationship, in my ministry, as it is in heaven. All right, so the fourth spirit-inspired prayer that we find recorded in the book of Acts is actually found in Acts chapter 7, verse 59 to 60. Whew, this is powerful. <clears throat> verse 59, Acts chapter 7, verse 59, the Bible said, and they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And verse 60, the Bible said, then he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with the sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Wow. The first thing that comes to my mind or to which my, my, my attention is drawn in this text is the details, the details that the writer gives this account. 
It's either he was there observing, looking at it as an eyewitness and was in close proximity to actually hear what Stephen was saying, or he got it from somebody who was you know, in that position. But I'll, I'll default to the first, uh, uh, the first opinion. The details that the writer gives, again, don't forget, like I said, when it comes to sudden prayers, the writer even gives us the words. And I think the Holy Spirit and the Father did that so that we as God's people can understand what is going on. He didn't let this, you know, get lost in time or get lost in, in the events of the day or in things happening. No, he ensured that we got it. He ensured that we not only know this was happening, but we actually got the, the text got the words that were being spoken. This is so powerful, saints of God. And look at it again. In Acts 7, verse 59, it said, and they stoned Stephen. Now, you must understand, at this time, the, 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 the Jews, the people of Israel, had perfected the act of stoning. They had been stoning from the days of Moses, if you remember. And this was thousands of years before now. So they had perfected it. They were good. Don't forget, somebody like David could pick a stone, put on a sling and foom, and it would hit Goliath on the forehead because they had perfected. They, I, I, many of them had perfected how to you know, sling stones and cast stones. That's number one. But number two, also consider the Bible says, as the hills surround Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is a rocky place. It's a hilly place. So when you, when you stoop down and pick a stone, it's a stone indeed. <laughs> it's not like, you know, sand or it's a real real stone it's a solid it's it's jagged it's rugged and rugged so imagine that jagged solid thing hauled by an expert who had perfected the act of stoning and is coming at an individual and by the way we're talking about a crowd we're talking about a multitude we don't even know how many but definitely you're looking at no less than 20 people and 20 stones coming at you at the same time oh you got to paint that picture in your mind to see what's going on here, saints of God. You've got to paint that picture because a lot of times we browse through scriptures and we don't get the import. We don't get the implication of what's going on. But put yourself in that position. Put yourself in that place. The Bible says earlier in the verses, they grabbed him, dragged him out of the city, threw him out, and then picked up stones and began to stone him. And so stones are coming from all the angles and you're trying to dodge some and some are bumping you in the face, hitting you on the jaw, your knee and all of that. And this man was crying out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Now I can imagine this initial prayer was a prayer coming from, you know, I don't want to say desperation, but there is a, there's an element of that because I mean, we are humans. <clears throat> Although he was full, full of the spirit, I'm going to come to that. That doesn't remove the, the, the human element. Uh, you know, I, I always tell people, I say, when you read the story of Daniel and Daniel was cast into the lion's den and the Lord shut the lions, you don't, you don't get it. I can almost tell you that when Daniel was cast there, I mean, his human nature came up. Oh God, I'm going to die. And then the lions began to come closer and he is doing like this. He's like, you know, nowhere to escape anyway. It's a pit. But rather than devour him, the lions came instead and started licking on him. He probably opened one eye and looked and said, wow, they're not devouring me. And then he then knew that God has shut the mouth of the lions. You know, when you describe miracles, we have to understand there's a natural dimension that marries with the supernatural dimension. Natural somehow enters the supernatural. The supernatural somehow enters the natural. So they go hand in hand. The Lord Jesus Christ cried, the Bible said, remember that? Eloi, Eloi, let me say back to man. My father, my father, why have you forsaken me? He cried on the cross. Don't remove that human element. Don't feel like you have to be a superman. No, who feels no pain. No, this man was feeling pain. This man was feeling pain. And that under that pain, he's crying out, Lord, receive my spirit. Because he knew this is my death. This is it. I'm going to die here. This is the end of the story. But even at that child of God, my question to us is, what do you call out when you are faced with a threat to your life, a threat of death? What comes out of you is what you have put in already. Is that when you begin to want to call your mom, you want to call your dad, you want to call your husband, you want to call your pastor, you want to call your bishop? Who do you call at such times? This man didn't call Simon. He didn't call any of the apostles. He called on Jesus. I know he had seen a vision. That's good. But even at that, under that terrible condition, 
Bible says he was calling on God. And I can imagine uh, uh, Luke just standing to the side and observing this whole thing happening. Oh, my God. The man is screaming, crying up. The body standing was still standing up, I assume. And the stones were coming at him. He was calling on God. And he was actually saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Now, of course, when you go back to the earlier verses, when he was still talking to the, uh, to the group of people, the Bible said that he was full of the spirit. That's uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 55 to 56. But he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, he actually told the people. Now, a few things here, I've mentioned this before. Number one, this is proof that the Holy Spirit was in charge because the Bible said he was full of the spirit. So this is not Stephen speaking from his own flesh because if it's me, I won't talk. I won't, I'm seeing the vision. Since you don't want to see talk about the vision, I won't talk to you about it. I will keep it to myself especially if it's going to provoke the people to want to kill him. But the Holy Spirit was doing this. The Holy Spirit was doing this. And, and in fact, not only was the Holy Spirit allowing him to speak what he was seeing, but can you see the revelation he brought forth there? We're told that the Lord Jesus is always seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. But here, the Philip, uh, Stephen said, I see him standing. <laughs> I see him standing. So there comes a time when Jesus even stands from his seat from his throne. Why? Because one of his own is coming home. He's ready to receive what is this. I'm saying all of this to encourage us, child of God, to make you not want to give up your faith in the face of death threat, in the face of satanic hordes, in the face of satanic aggression, in the face of whatever is going on. You've got to know because the Lord has made sure that this is, you know, written for us in scriptures to know what happens to matters. What is the fate of mat matters when, when, when we are failed, when they are faced? See, I say we, <laughs> but truly we look at ourselves from that perspective because, you know, when you go back to the book of Hebrews 12, the Bible said, they kept speaking of a, a city whose builder and maker is God. And they spoke of themselves as not being a part of this earthly realm, not being a part of what's going on here. They know they are here for, for the time being to advance the kingdom of God, but their hearts are somewhere else. Every child of God actually ought to be in that position. If you still have anything you're holding on to here on the, on the earth that is, you think is worth your life, Jesus said, what shall a man give in, a, in exchange to his life? The whole world is not even worthy of the soul of one man. Think about it. He being full of the spirit, gazing to heaven, he declared it. But he also gives us a revelation that Jesus stands up to receive his martyrs, stands up to receive those who hold on to the faith, even to the very end. And that is something glorious. But the next thing that got my attention was how he, Stephen, demonstrated the mind of Christ. So he began from receive my spirit and got made a switch from not just talking about myself, my spirit. I mean, Jesus prayed the same into your hands. I commend my spirit or my soul but he also begins to pray like Jesus would pray. And that is the mind of Christ. We're told in Philippians chapter two from verse five to eight, they say, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So there is such a thing called the mind of Christ. And Paul is saying here that we as God's people must aim for that same mind of Christ. It's a type or uh, a sort of disposition that we find in Christ, that Christ has, you know, uh, exemplified or, or, or given to us as a template. And, and Stephen was able to attain that. Uh, I mean, how, how do you know the mind of Christ? Uh, make, did not make himself equal with God, uh, made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a bond servant and coming in likeness of man. Being found in appearance, the man humbled himself, basically. Humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross. So the mind of Christ is that posture that is willing to lay down its life or lay down life, lay down one's life in obedience to the will of God, in accordance with the mandate of God. That is what it is. I know a lot of people talk about it, quote it, pray it, but you have to know exactly what scripture says about it now. Here are examples. So we know the Bible said, then he knelt down. 
Now, I assume the kneeling down, I don't know if he deliberately did that as a posture of prayer, or maybe it was the stones that sub subdued him. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> maybe the stones subdued him, hit him in the leg. He couldn't stand anymore. He collapsed, whatever the case. But the Bible said then he gave out, he cried out with a loud voice, <coughs> Lord, do not charge them with the sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So you can see he was dying. He was getting ready to give up. He was getting ready to give up the ghost, give up the spirit. So these were his, became his last words as he was going, as he was departing, as he was, as the breath was getting out. So he probably had been overwhelmed already. <clears throat> and I'm going to talk a little bit about that as we proceed. But let's look at, you know, the mind of Christ, how it aligns with it. In Matthew 27, verse 50, Jesus by now was on the cross. Matthew's account tells us that Jesus cried out again with a loud voice <clears throat> and yielded up the spirit. So Matthew didn't tell us what he cried out. I, I know he didn't just make a, made a, 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 you know, a, 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 a voice or a sound without any meaning. No, I don't think so. I think Luke captured what Jesus said in that loud voice. Luke 23 verse 34, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And after that, he gave up the ghost. After that, he yielded his spirit. So the question then is, how could mere mortals attain the mind of Christ? How can we as God's people, how can we as mortals, humans, attain this mind of Christ? Because the natural inclination of humans is, is, is self-defense. The natural inclination of humans is, you know, we, we are self-defensive, uh, you know, organisms. We are self-defensive in our, in our being. Even if, I mean, even your very being, the immune system, for instance, everything fights back. Everything pushes back. So humans defend themselves. Humans are always up to fight back or to push back. But the mind of Christ is not that type. The mind of Christ, for the sake of the, of the will of God, is ready to lay down life. How can we attain that? Well, the text is very clear on the matter. First and foremost, it tells us in Acts 7, verse 55, that Stephen was full of the Spirit. That's where they start from. So you see, those who, who keep relegating the Holy Spirit, oh, you don't need the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't flow these days. I don't know where you're coming from. You cannot do anything that pleases God without the Holy Spirit. You cannot walk the faith walk. You cannot live the supernatural life. We cannot please God without the Holy Spirit. And now we see we cannot be partakers of the divine nature of Christ without the Holy Spirit. He was full of the Holy Spirit. And that same verse later on tells us he gazed into heaven. This is what I call the visions of God. So it's, all, it's also good to, to not just go with human senses because a lot of times believers do cliches. You know, we can quote scriptures and say, oh, I believe I am there. I believe I, this is who I am. You can say that. That's good. But it's always better when there is a conviction. It's always better when there is proof to what you're saying. In his case, his, his eyes were open to see a vision of God. And that vision of God further reinforced his faith. That vision of God further reinforced his being for what he was getting ready to go through. <clears throat> you say, is that important? Absolutely, it is. Because we're told concerning the Lord Jesus Christ that the joy of God's glory was set before him. See that? Jesus didn't just say, okay, I came from heaven. I had a virgin birth. I'm the son of God. So cross, here I come. No. He kept in view, constant view, the glory of God, which from which is where he derived joy from. He remained in a continual vision, in a like a vision in perpetuity, a continual vision of the glory of God. And that vision, that understanding of the glory of God kept him in a state of joy, such joy that could take him through the cross. That's why he could endure the cross. He could endure the ridicule. He could endure the contradiction. He could endure the humiliation, the shame and all of that, the reproach. Because he's, he, there is a vision, right? That is, look at what the Bible said. It was set before him, set. It was set before him. It didn't go away. It was set. It was constantly envisioning the glory of God and drew joy from that. 
So you don't just jump in because you've been in church for 20 years or because you can quote Genesis to Revelation or because you speak in tongues or you feel goosebumps. No, make sure that you know, there is this dimension of the supernatural that is added to the faith of God that is in you. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 so we should look unto Jesus, emulate Jesus, follow after the pattern of Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You see that? That's whom we must follow. <clears throat> and what did he do? Who for the joy that was set before him. That joy was set before him. It's like fixed, not going anywhere. That joy was set before him and so he could endure the cross, despising the shame, and now has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hallelujah to that. Stephen saw that glory, and that glory equipped him, enabled him for what he was getting ready to go through. So Stephen got a glimpse of that glory, and it changed his perspective. Jesus had a constant view, constant sight, or had it in constant focus. But Stephen had a glimpse of it, a momentary glimpse of, glimpse of that vision, glimpse of that glory of God, and it changes perspective so much. Listen to this so much that Stephen considered it the most precious last breath request. Ah, to pray for his murderers so that they can also get a chance at this glory of God. So starting from Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, which you could interpret as trepidation, desperation, you know, fear of death, you could say all of that because they all come to play. But at the point, this man made a transition. There was a change of perspective. He's no longer praying for his own spirit to be saved. He's now praying for the spirit, the souls of his murderers to have a chance at eternal life. That is the mind of Christ and that is powerful. <clears throat> it is only the Holy Spirit who changes perspectives. It is only the Holy Spirit, both our perspective or the perspective of others. And this all shows you prayer goes beyond asking for this and that. Give me, give me, give me. No, prayer is about establishing the will of God. Prayer is about knowing the will of God. Prayer is about going beyond the natural dimension to even into the eternal realms of God. Prayer is about understanding the will of God concerning even sinners, even sinners who are anti-God. And then prayer is about aligning, like Stephen now, align himself. And began to declare, let that be, let that become the reality. Without the Holy Spirit, we could not partake in the divine nature of God. All the 17 steps, 11 steps to whatever is all, is all a farce. It is the Holy Spirit. So you could say one step, Holy Spirit, get the Holy Spirit. He is the one. He's the one who's been given to get us there. We will be self-directed, sowing to the flesh, and only reaping corruption without the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. We're going to pray, and uh, we're going to pray based on what we've heard so far. And I pray that, you know, this is definitely ministering to us because the Lord God is letting us know by his word that this is the way to go. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. We give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. We give you praise. We give you honor. Thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you, eternal Father and Lord God. <clears throat> oh, yes, we come to you, Lord. You are eternal. We acknowledge you as sovereign. Sovereign Lord, that's who you are. We acknowledge you as maker of heaven and earth. We acknowledge you as the maker of heaven and earth and all that is in them, and that includes us. So we humble ourselves before you as well. In your wisdom, Lord, you chose to reveal salvation and redemption through your son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we accept that. We receive that. We embrace that. We thank you for it. And so, Lord Jesus, we thank you. Your sacrificial death, your resurrection gave us access into the family of God. Oh, how glad we are. Oh, how delighted we are to know that we are in the family of God. And knowing that we're in the family of God, Lord, we do not come from a beggarly perspective. We do not come as, as those who are outcasts. We do not come as those who have no relationship with you. No, we know we have a relationship with you. You even said, come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. We come to you, Lord Jesus. We are grateful for your sacrifice. We are grateful for your shed blood. But then you also turned around and gave us the Holy Spirit. 
You sent the Holy Spirit to be with us and to be in us forever. We are grateful for that. We thank you for that. And we embrace that truth. And so we turn to you, precious Holy Spirit. We acknowledge your continual presence that continually transforms us into the likeness of sons of God from one level of glory to another as we keep beholding your glory with unveiled faces. So first we pray, remove the veil, Holy Spirit. Remove every veil, whether they are veils of traditions of men, whether they are veils of religion, whether they are veils of cultural leanings, whether they are veils of personal preferences, whether they are veils of idiosyncrasies, whatever veils they are, oh, Holy Spirit, cause your light to shine to remove every veil just like you did for Simon regarding Gentiles. Remove every veil. Remove every veil. Doctrinal veils. Remove all spirit of God. And then open our eyes to behold the glory of God. To behold with unveiled faces. It's possible, child of God, to keep beholding the glory of God yet with a veiled face. So the first thing is for the veil to be removed. And Paul says, as we turn to the Lord, the veil is removed. So, Lord, we turn to you. We turn our hearts to you. We turn our posture to you. Cause the veil to be removed so we can behold the glory with unveiled faces. And even in doing so, may we be transformed. Let transformation be our reality. May we be transformed from one level of glory to another by the spirit of the living God. We receive transformation, oh God. We receive the transformation that comes from you. We receive the transformation that comes through your ever-abiding presence, O oh Holy Spirit, we yield to your work of transformation. And you always bring us keys of the kingdom of God. The Lord Jesus said, I will give you keys of the kingdom. And we know those keys come through the Holy Spirit, illuminating the word of God. And you have illuminated the word of God to us today, so we thank you. We receive this key. We receive this truth. We receive this insight. We receive this revelation. We receive this truth that you have brought our way, precious Holy Spirit. And so we begin to pray in that direction that today we pray that, that we will be full of the Holy Spirit. Oh, precious Holy Spirit, that we will be full of your presence, full of your power, full of your substance. Oh, Holy Spirit, in an ever increasing progression from one level to the other level of understanding, level of insight, level of knowledge, level of understanding, level of spiritual wisdom and revelation through the spirit of Christ that we might be full, that you continue to feel us, continue to feel us and help us to stay full of this continual presence of the Holy Spirit. Teach us, O oh Holy Spirit, and help us to fix our gaze to heaven. The Bible says Stephen fixed his gaze to heaven. He gazed into heaven. May we fix our gaze on heaven, not on the white house or black house or blue house or red house or any house whatsoever. We want to fix our eyes on the eternal realms of glory from whence comes our help. Our helper is the Lord. Humans have shown us they are self-destruct. Even the very best have shown us they are, they are deceptive in their own being. The heart of man is desperately wicked. Desperately wicked. Who can know it? I said, the Lord God who searches it through its reins. So Lord, we do not trust human systems anymore, but we set our eyes on you. Holy Spirit, teach us and help us to set our eyes, to fix our gaze to the heavens. That's where our help comes from. And as we do, that we might see and behold the glory of the eternal realms. May we go beyond the glory of this realm, the glory of planet Earth, begin to behold the glory of the eternal realms of God, just like Stephen. And oh, like Jesus, may our joy come from that realm. Many of us, our joy comes from planet Earth. What Earth offers us what earth promises us, what we can attain from earth, child of God, like Paul would say, if only in this life we have hope, we have all men most miserable. Lord, may our joy come only from your presence. May our true joy, the substance of our joy come from heaven's reality, come from the eternal realms, come from that which you reveal to us through visions of God. To open our eyes like Stephen to see the Lord Jesus in his majesty. 
to see him in his glory, to see him victorious as he truly is, for he is not in the manger anymore. <laughs> he is not on the cross anymore. He is not in the grave anymore. He is the risen Lord. He is the exalted one. He is seated in the majesty on high. Exalted to the place of highest majesty. His king of kings. His lord of lords. He's the ruler over the kings of the earth. He's the eternal one. And we say hallelujah to that. May we see him in this present truth reality. Present form. And not keep reverting to the baby in the manger. Or just seeing him only on the cross. Those were all necessary stages. But now he's the king of kings. Lord Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, open our eyes to behold your glory, to behold your majesty, to behold you in your authority, your regal posture and position. And from that place of understanding, we also begin to pray for the unsaved everywhere. Because Lord, beholding your glory, we would not even want the one who says they are enemies to miss that. We won't want them to miss it. So we pray for the unsaved everywhere family members, friends, colleagues. Lord, may not even mention their names, but they are running through our minds right now. We're praying for every one of them that they will all be given a chance at salvation, that we have a chance, Lord, at eternal life, that they will have a chance to have an encounter with Jesus, that we have a chance to behold the glory of God before they leave this earth, oh God. And we have seen in this day and age people dying like chickens, oh God, everywhere. People just dying, just dropping dead. People just dying, just dropping dead. Lord, we pray with greater intensity. The Lord, people within our circles of influence, family members, relatives, neighbors, oh God, colleagues. The Lord, they will have an encounter with the, G, with the Lord Jesus. Have an encounter with salvation before they leave this world, before they leave this earth, oh God, for that is what matters most. It's no longer about how one lives, whether it's COVID, or whether it's accident, or whether it's stray bullet, or whether it's drug overdose, whatever the case. But Lord, that they will have an encounter with the Lord Jesus, that their souls may be saved, that they will have a chance at salvation through Christ. That Lord, they will not leave this earth without getting a chance to be saved. And so out of hardened criminals, hardened enemies of the cross, hardened enemies of righteousness, just like Saul, may you find Saul's of our generation, who will be transformed to Paul's of our generation. We pray this, oh God, knowing that it is the mind of Christ. And we say amen to it, Lord. We say amen to it, Lord, thanking you for releasing your power and your spirit and your angels and your sons and your daughters through the word of salvation and the word of reconciliation to usher souls into the kingdom before they depart. We give you praise. We give you honor and glory, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen and amen. Thank you so much for your time. You have a blessed rest of the evening until we come your way shortly on Friday, hopefully, uh, if not on Sunday. But you have a blessed day. Stay elevated. We love you. Bye-bye now.